Welcome to episode 5 of Nature Hits the Books, the show where I chat with authors about their science books. In this episode, I'm joined by Jay Owens, a writer and researcher whose book Dust, the story of the modern world in a trillion particles, was published recently. And, as its name suggests, it's a deep dive into a substance that you might be able to see right now. I certainly can. Much like dust itself, Jay's book travels the globe, looking at the impacts that these microscopic particles are having on the world, our health, our environment, and the role that humanity has played in creating them. Jay Owens, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks very much, Ben. It's great to be here. Let's talk about your book then. So the genesis of it, it starts somewhat prosaically, I think it's fair to say, when you were putting off studying and looking at the dust floating around your flat. But dust is so much more than the flakes of skin that we have to clean up, I suppose. It seems like it's the ultimate fate of so much stuff. I mean, how are you defining dust in this book? Well, possibly in a way that might annoy some aerosol scientists, but very, very broadly. For me, dust is tiny flying particles. You know, it's a particulate, it's solid. This is important. You know, I'm trying to exclude some of the liquid aerosols here. Typically, you know, sort of five micrometers in size, 10 micrometers in size, really minute fractions of a human hair are the inevitable comparison. And it's airborne, it's flying, it starts somewhere else, it's generally been lifted up and it's whooshed off, whether that's just circulating three feet around your room when you're cleaning it, or whether it's been whisked into the stratosphere and sort of flung across the Atlantic Ocean. From that, we're looking at mineral dust from deserts of the world and from agricultural areas as the biggest source of dust by mass. We're looking at black carbon soot as a particularly potent climate forcer. I'm looking at radioactive fallout. You know, microplastics are tiny modern dust too. It seems like this is a book that looks at scale, right? These tiny microscopic things that you almost can't see, but these microscopic particles having global effects. Well, on the biggest scale, they are heating and cooling our planet, doing both at the same time, depending on what kind of dust we're looking at. And they're also involved in the oxygen cycle, the nitrogen cycle, you know, minerals from the Sahara lifting up and travelling into the Atlantic, feeding algae, which enable them to photosynthesise and produce an enormous part of the world's oxygen. So it's not dead, it's very active out there, interacting with every other Earth system. But of course, it's also a product of our economic activity. You know, I this book I am writing about capitalism to a great extent. Dust is a result of air pollution. Particulate pollution is the fifth biggest killer on the planet. I believe about 8 million people a year die of diseases caused by particulate air pollution. But it's tiny, it's hard to measure. You know, in economic senses as well as ecological ones, it is actually an enormous force in the world. And one of the things that comes up repeatedly, and I think links into all of those, is the intimate relationship between dust and water and how our thirst for the latter has led to an increase in the former. Absolutely. So mineral dust, does it make sense? Yeah, it tends to come from deserts, but it also comes from desertifying places in the world. The world's deserts are uh, prone to expanding as the world gets hotter and we use its groundwater, you know, across the American West and um, many, many other parts of the sort of world's dust belt across the middle of the planet. We're pumping groundwater in order to use it for agriculture. You go out into the remotest parts of Nevada or Arizona, middle of nowhere, and there'll be these bright green rings of the alfalfa pumped on ancient paleo water, tens of thousands of years old, that's filtered down into the aquifers deep in the rocks. And it's like another fossil fuel almost. We're pumping this ancient water up. The water table drops in these places and the plants that, you know, when the wind blows, hold the soil together, the plants die. And once you've killed off your vegetation, you then have a surface that becomes a dust producing zone. One of these places then that you do write about quite extensively is what's now known as the Owens Valley. No relation, I have to say. What's the story there? How has dust come to be and what effects has it had? So for many years, Owens Valley or Payahunadu in the native Paiute language is the biggest dust producing source in the United States. It's this environmental disaster zone, 250 miles northeast of Los Angeles. And 150 years ago, wasn't there at all. It's this beautiful, remote desert valley with a huge lake, about 110 square miles, and in gushing sources of water. And two men come up from Los Angeles, the city's rapidly growing, and they see these torrents of water and they think, we could use that. Whole decades of dodgy dealing, 
canal building, legal shenanigans, and they end up owning essentially the entire Owens Valley and shipping pretty much all its water out to Los Angeles. The Owens Valley turns to dust. The lake dries up in about 10 or 15 years. And lake bed dust, right, is particularly tiny. It's all of the silt from hundreds of square miles has been washed into that lake. There's no plants on it. It's super salty, so nothing really grows very well. So wind blows, whoosh, picks it all up um, and produces an absolute air pollution disaster zone. And this is disproportionately having an effect on different groups of people, as you write about. Yes. So, you know, Owens Valley is the moment, it's a rural area, little towns, not especially rich. And it's also particularly got Indigenous Americans, Paiute and Shoshone people. And to them, you know, the lake had been a sacred place. It had been the centre of their economic and practical agricultural lives, a source of food, a source of deep spiritual meaning. This is gone. This this vanishes. You know, the ranchers and, and the farmers in the valley as well you know, lose livelihoods. But they're small people and they're up against the might of Los Angeles. And, you know, I write a lot about sort of these peripheral places and the marginal people who live there who are generally indigenous. They are people of colour. They are poor white people. They don't win in these battles. And it takes an awful lot to change that, though change did happen in the Owens Valley. That's the setup then, the history that this water was taken away. And efforts have been made to try and reverse, mitigate that. What has science done in this sort of situation and what effect has it had? The Owens Valley is such an interesting story because it shows not just how the Western Hemisphere's biggest dust source was made, but also how it was fixed. So the story starts really in the the solutions in the 1970s with the rise of Environmental Protection Agency and air pollution legislation. You need a model of what air pollution is, what kinds of particulates it's made. You've got a series of aerosol scientists when, and um, working on Owens Lake itself, doing tons of experimental studies to understand actually how is dust picked up from the surface of the lake and how might you change the surface? You know, what happens if you put gravel on it, if you dampen it, if you put ruts into it and it changes how the air flows. If you grow vegetation on it, what kinds of vegetation might like to grow there? So that starts to produce a scientific basis for how the dust might be stopped and combined with about 20 plus years of uh, vicious legal battles. In 2000, the Department of Water Power were required to return some water to Owens Lake and start building dust control works. So now you have this place that looks like a building site almost. It's huge trucks carrying aggregates, hundreds and hundreds of miles of water pipe, pools of brine, pools of water. You know, it's the least natural looking environment on earth, but it did two things. Firstly, it did genuinely reduce the dust levels. Um, I can't say that this is fixed. There is yet more legal battles, but reduce the dust levels much, much closer to safe levels. And it's also turned into, astonishingly, a kind of special wildlife zone that all of the birds that migrate up and down the Western Flyway in the United States inland, they see a little bit of water come back and they're like, yes, we're going to sit on it and eat brine shrimp. So in only about five or six years, this place had gone from a sort of dead, dry place into a kind of astonishing preserve for waterfowl. Tens of thousands in their annual migrations sort of sit down on the lake in the spring and in the autumn and gorge on the brine fly that live there. You know, it's this sort of proliferation of wildlife on what looks like a building site. It's the strangest site in the world, but it's strangely beautiful. And this isn't just the case in the US. You've got the story of the Aral Sea between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, which, despite its name, was, and I think that word needs underlining, was the fourth largest lake in the world, and it is no longer. And yet again, we now find ourselves in a situation where dust is rampant. Yes, absolutely. So it's not a dissimilar story to the Owens Valley, in a sense, but there it's the growth of Los Angeles, the city. For the Aral Sea, it's cotton targets in the Soviet Union and Moscow demanding increased cotton production. Cotton is freakish, it needs tons of water, but it also grows quite well in desert if you have the water supply, which deserts don't. So you're fishing it out the Amu Daria River, the river stops flowing. And for the Aral Sea, again, it turns into a dust bowl. It's super polluted. And lots of heavy metals and minerals and the pesticides that have been used. It's really not good for anybody's health. It gets picked up by the wind and you know, starts being inhaled by the people that live nearby. And what effects have been seen in the Owens Valley and where the Aral Sea 
is slash was, I suppose. In both places, you've got rise in asthma as the first kind of big sign. You know, people's lungs are irritated by small particulates. This you know, extends on to bronchitis, other lung diseases. Also, I think there's a lot of kidney diseases around Moynac in the Aral Sea area because the salt is getting into the water supply as well. There's not really clean water there. Dust has the ability to get properly inside our bodies. The smaller particle is, the deeper it can get in. So big dust at least is stopped by your lungs. You've got your cilia, you've got the sort of the body's defence systems. But really small dust under about a micrometer in size gets through into the bloodstream. And once it's in the blood, it can go anywhere and it can do anything. Every organ in the body is potentially affected by dust and particulate air pollution. And latest research is finding that it's a big cause of heart disease and heart problems. Studies looking at its impact on Alzheimer's, dementia, potentially conditions like ADHD and depression. I mean, I think we've talked quite a lot here about the negative aspects of dust, of which there are many in your book, it has to be said. But it's not all negative. It's helping researchers, for example, learn more about the ancient climate and deep time, which is a wonderful phrase. It is pretty good, isn't it? So the dust, as we say, it rises up and it gets everywhere. And this includes two very remote places such as Antarctica and the Greenland ice sheet. And dust each year goes and sits on top of the snow and then it snows some and then more dust the next year, more snow, which produce you know, a layered record of what's been in the air over the last hundreds of years, thousands of years, tens of thousands and millions of years. Of course, ice core scientists are also looking at dissolved gases and so forth in the ice cores. But dust is a significant source as well, from understanding historic volcanic eruptions to using it to model past climates and you know, understanding what might have been desertified tens and hundreds of thousands of years ago by what kinds of minerals are in the dust and, you know, where were your deserts and what were they producing? You've got some astonishing stuff in there. So, for example, there's lead in the Greenland ice sheet from Roman silver smelting in Spain about 2,000 years ago. And you can chart the rise and fall of the Spanish end of the Roman economy by how much silver they were smelting. It's an archive. It's this astonishing record of human activity and it's giving scientists so many tools to understand how the world works and it's just little grains of dust you know sitting in the middle of nowhere i mean dust and climate it seems are so intertwined and and the processes that kick dust up from one place whether it's the owens valley or the sahara or wherever it is affecting climate processes thousands and thousands of miles away for example and one of the things that's so fascinating is just sometimes how little we really know what's going on The dust, you know, it remains one of the big unknowns in climate modelling. I was talking to scientists at NASA who were saying that one of the major climate models was using data that only had a few thousand soil records for across the entire world. So you want to know what kind of dust is being made by different places because it has different reflectivity properties. You know, is it lighter or paler in colour? Is it bigger or smaller particle sizes? That impacts how it reflects sunlight. That impacts how it impacts cloud formation. So you need to know what your dust is made of to work how to put it into your climate models and we just didn't have particularly good data on this so there's a need to just go and actually scan the planet properly with spectroscopy to go and say what is the world made of what kind of dust is every part of it making so that we can actually model what the dust is doing and it does seem like when it comes to these global scales that the equilibrium has been shifted we think about the dreadful forest fires that you write about an experience for example and soot being kicked up that's changing how all these processes are happening. And very fast. Were I going to write this book again, I would need to write more about forest fires. And my understanding is that Canada's forests in the last year have been a net source of carbon, that they have been putting it out into the world as huge, huge forest fires have burnt across millions and millions of acres. You know, you see these images in the newspaper of sky turning orange across the East Coast of the United States. In New York, you know, the air is thick, that the air is dirty. It's like the Dust Bowl in the 1930s that these huge environmental disasters are actually making their way, making their impact felt thousands of miles away. You say several times that dust is a political issue. What do you mean when you say it is a political issue? It's to recognise that dust is human caused in first part. Even 25% of the world's mineral dust is human made through water pumping, through agriculture, through desertification. And it's political in the power relations, the inequalities of who's impacted by it, who causes it versus who pays the price. And 
it's to recognise it's not inevitable, not to fall into a kind of defeatism. You know, is there always going to be dust in the world? Absolutely. But do we have to accept the state of pollution at the moment? Absolutely not. It is changeable. That's what I mean when I say it's political. It's unjust and it's an injustice that can be changed. If we move away from these kind of giant situations and maybe zoom in a little bit, something that you touch upon is that the removal of dust. So cleanliness is seen as a mark of modernity, that we have to be seen as cleaner than our predecessors to be seen as more advanced. And that that's really had a sense in the UK and the US, at least, where you write about, had a sense of making the modern world to an extent. So, you know, cleanliness was in a way created. And this is not, again, to say that medieval people were filthy. That's the sort of historical notion we project back in time, as you say, to make ourselves seem more progressive and like we're doing better. But dirt is intensely morally freighted, right? It's not a really a neutral term. You call somebody dirty, it is a huge insult. The idea that cleanliness is next to godliness was, as with a Victorian notion, certainly popularised at that time. But it stayed in our culture. And I'm interested in how dust came to be kind of visible, how dust came to matter to people. Um, it doesn't seem like it was a source of massive anxiety to people in medieval times or early modern times, that you tried to keep your house orderly, you tried to keep it neat. But if you're living in you know, rough wooden surfaces and dirt floors and so on, dust is not visible in the same way it is on pristine glass and all the possessions people have. You need more stuff in your home to care about dusting it. You need higher value goods that you care about. And it sort of tracks alongside awareness of like the germ theory of disease and an array of vigorous sanitary health reformers from the 1840s through to the early 1900s, really going in and trying to teach people how to clean properly as a public health mission, uh, but also as a moral mission, trying to make the working classes clean up their act and be good middle-classized citizens. So it really evangelical campaigning idea of dirt is this moral stain on your character and demand that cleaning it was not just practically useful, good for health terms, but a sort of spiritual mission, really. I mean, you think about sort of cleaning up and we think about public health, but in some cases you write about how near total removal of dust is needed and clean rooms in particular. And someone who's worked in a lab, I know that there are cases when you really want to try and make sure that the air is as clean as it can be and how this ultra cleanliness has led to the science and manufacturing of the 20th and 21st centuries. I mean, when we talk about some of these clean areas, how clean are we talking, Jay, compared to, I don't know, say a regular room? So a typical room might contain about 35 million particles over 0.5 micrometers in size. You know, it doesn't seem like too much. When we're in that space, right, that's not going to feel filthy. But when you're trying to make a semiconductor or package photographic film or do high precision manufacturing of that sort, where you're NASA and you're trying to analyse interstellar dust, you can't really have 35 million particles of other dust getting in the way. And so that's that's why we need clean rooms. And they come in different classes. And even what you're doing sort of nominal clean room lab work might still have a million particles per cubic metre. Each standard of cleanliness goes down an order of magnitude. So 100,000 particles per cubic metre, 10,000 particles per cubic metre. Once you're trying to only have 100 particles per cubic metre, this is incredibly difficult. You have to look at every single material being used in that environment that it doesn't decay over time. There's complicated management of air flows. You have to have clean room cleaning cloths because you know your normal textiles just shedding fibres all over the place. It's filthy. So as I understand, the cleanest place in the world is a facility in Millican, South Africa, used for manufacturing clean room cleaning equipment, <laughs> which is very poetic, very pleasing indeed. But you know, in order to make the microchip, in order to make the atom bomb, you need clean environments. You can't do microscale electronics in super dust ridden environments. And so in this way, dust is part of the making of the modern world. It's expulsion in this case enables the technologies that we use. You mentioned the atomic bomb there, and the A-bomb is symbolic of the modern world, but also of dust creation as well, and that its birth and testing led to a huge amount of this stuff being kicked up. What's the legacy of the tests that have happened, and what are researchers finding in terms of how this dust is affecting people? So when we talk about the atom bomb, we very often think only of Hiroshima and Nagasaki when it was used in war, but there have been thousands of other atom bomb detonations in order to build and test these bombs. And particularly in the 1940s, 50s and very early 60s, these were above ground bomb tests. And subsequently, it was started to be buried and done underground. So at least the 
mushroom cloud and the dust could be contained. But those 1950s and 60s tests had enormous and underrecognized health consequences because huge amounts of irradiated, not just the bomb material itself, which is, of course, radioactive, but irradiated soil, all of it is just flung up into the air. The bomb tests are done in remote places, almost always, in fact, on indigenous land, really remote rural places, people not given much choice in what happens there. But the fallout stays a lot of five or six days, which is long enough for it to blow across America from Nevada, where the tests happened in the States, or blow from Kazakhstan, where Russia did its tests, or Australia, the Pacific Islands. And that fallout falls everywhere. And Different types of nuclear isotopes obviously have different decay lengths, but some of them hang around for a very, very long time. And as a result, international physicians for the prevention of nuclear war have taken UN estimates of radiation exposures and done a series of public health modelling that goes from the radiation doses populations would have received into cancer deaths. And they use this to estimate the number of cancer fatalities caused as a result of above ground nuclear testing. They reckon that only a fifth of those deaths would have happened by the year 2000. There's this long tail of deaths in centuries to come, many of which we haven't seen. And they estimate as many as 2.4 million people will get cancer and will die as a result of the nuclear testing. And it's a strange, strange slow tail risk. because they say, most of these deaths haven't yet occurred. And people are still campaigning very, very actively to have the costs on both people living near the bomb site recognised and for the risks to be fully known. And you spent some time in one of those areas where the bombs were tested on where uranium was mined, talking to researchers who are working with local and indigenous peoples living in the area. Again, once we're looking at hazard from a dusty perspective, dust is produced really at every stage. So it's not just the bomb detonation. We've got to go, where does the uranium come from? A lot of it's mined in the Four Corners region of the United States, so Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, Colorado, which a lot of this is the Navajo Nation Reservation and Pueblo Reservations. And about 60 miles west of Albuquerque, New Mexico, you had the Jack Pile Paguate mine was dug. The largest uranium mine in the world at the time, it was sort of about eight miles long, and it's built about 400 metres away from the village of Paguate on the Laguna Pueblo Reservation. And you know, it's a mine. People are using explosives to loosen the rock, carting tons of rock around there. And a lot of local people are working on the mine themselves. This is the 1950s and 60s. There is no sense of occupational health at work. There are no dust masks. There are no radiation dosimeters. You know, the ground shakes in people's homes. Dust falls onto the food they eat. The miners come home dusty. Their wives take their clothes and wash them. And in that way, women and children are exposed as much to the dust as predominantly the men who are working on the mine itself. And so... What they find is that a generation before doctors had been looking at Navajo people and Pueblo people and saying, do they not get cancer? Are they immune? You've got really excellent population health. And then in a few years, men are dying in their 30s and 40s from cancers, from lung diseases. And it just sort of takes a generation. And it's still an issue now, even as the mine has stopped operating. And the word is remediation. How do we improve? How do we sort of restore a site the size of the world's largest uranium mine? It's a huge task. But there are scientists at the University of New Mexico. I spoke with a fantastic interdisciplinary team. And you've got people working across pharmacy, engineering, anthropology, geography, chemistry, looking at what has happened in our landscape nearby, what has been the cost, and what can be done about it? And it's the best example I think I've probably ever seen of scientists working in partnerships with local citizens. They're doing things like testing every water well on the Navajo reservation, which wells are contaminated, which aren't, which are safe. Looking for ways, for example, bioremediation using plants that can actually store minerals more effectively. If you supplement people with zinc, for example, that prevents their bodies taking up the heavy metals so much. And a cheap zinc tablet for a few pence per day can keep people's health safe. And it's just joining the dots on every single way heavy metals can impact the body and finding solutions at practical local sources. So hugely inspiring stuff. People are really motivated by trying to 
restore not just the land, but justice and equity to the populations that have been affected by it. Joining the dots seems so important for so many of the issues that you talk about and situations that you talk about, because this is actually connected to this, but we didn't know that in the 1930s when we did that. And now we need to try and figure that out. And there's a legacy aspect to a great deal of the stories that you tell. You know, how dust operates in our culture, there's this story about history and time and recognising the long duration of things, of you know, ruins and that poeticism from it, I think, can help us look at places over time and help to think about these longer durations, not just what is this place now, but what does it become when we have stopped using it? You know, can we make good ruins? Can we build from our modern infrastructure today something that's going to work in 10,000 years? Well, finally, I mean, you've been on this journey and you've taken a broad look at, I guess, what could be considered a very niche subject that we just wouldn't consider a lot of the time, right? Unless we're cleaning up or whatever it is. What has this journey taught you as a person? I mean, are you conscious of what you're breathing in when you're walking around, for example? A little bit, a little bit. As a cyclist in London, you know, you get in and you sort of get a cotton pad and wipe it across your face and you see this black grime. I think, you know, I'm not anxious. I'm not personally vibrating in panic with every lungful of air I take. It's really just taught me a lesson about how interconnected everything is. Recognising we're permeable. We aren't just powerful agents acting on the planet and shaping it to our very whims. The planet gets back inside us quite literally. Everything we do produces dust. That dust gets into our bodies. And there's a kind of humility in that. What we make sort of has an ability to fight back a little bit. And if we can recognise that, that seems like quite a good way to build a bit more of a sustainable future. Jay Owens, thank you so much. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure to talk. Jay Owens there. Her book, Dust, The Story of the Modern World in a Trillion Particles, is out now. That's it for episode five of Nature Hits the Books. If you have any feedback on the show, why not ping us an email to podcast at nature.com with the subject line, Nature Hits the Books. Otherwise, look out for the next episode soon. The music used in this episode was called To Clarity by Air A via Epidemic Sound and Getty Images. I'm Benjamin Thompson. Thanks for listening. Listener.